Well, an important day passed completely unnoticed a few days ago on December 15th, which was, of course, this past Wednesday, was Bill of Rights Day. Uh, actually, Bill of Rights Day was first celebrated in 1941 and has been non-celebrated pretty much ever since then. It is the day that the Bill of Rights became uh, ratified by a sufficient number of states back in the late 1700s to have the Ten Amendments added to the Constitution. And I've discussed a little bit of this before on the show, the fact that when people say that the Constitution ought to be studied in school, or in fact people think they have studied the Constitution in school, most all of it has to do with the procedures for electing a president, for when Congress is supposed to meet, and things of this sort. It's just routine, technical, agenda kind of stuff that doesn't mean anything. There are two important sections of the Bill of Rights, and they are the only things that really need to be studied. You could go over the other things briefly once, and that would be enough. But focus really should be made on Article 1, Section 8, which lays out the things that Congress may legislate on, the national defense, the post office, the post roads, the judiciary, and so on. Those are the functions that were delegated to the Constitution by the 13 states that formed the United States of America. That's one section of the Constitution that should be studied in depth. And the second section is, of course, the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights is just the opposite. Instead of saying what the government may do, it points out what the government may not do. And perhaps the most important part of the entire Constitution is the Tenth Amendment, which says that the powers that have not been delegated to the United States by this document are reserved to the states or to the people themselves. In other words, there is nothing that Congress can be allowed to do unless it is specified in the Constitution itself. And there is no authority in the Constitution for the federal government to be involved in health care, welfare, education, foreign aid, and a host of other things, such as you know studying how to better produce fertilizer in Alabama and things of this sort, which are routinely included in budget bills. So the point being that the study of the Constitution should focus on this understanding of what the Constitution is. It is a document that limits the powers of government, that authorizes it to do a few things. Now, there was an article in the Washington Times this past week called Giving Away Our Freedoms, and it appeared on Bill of Rights Day, and it was by Rick Lynch. And the point that was made was that some of the anti-federalists, that is the people who were opposed to the Constitution, said that the Bill of Rights was a dangerous instrument. By spelling out freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and so forth, it gave the impression that these were the only rights the people had, and that Congress was free to take away any of the other rights that somebody might think of, such as the right to privacy or whatever. And that as a result of, that bill, of the passing the Bill of Rights, this great mistake, according to the Anti-Federalists, uh, we have reached this point today where there is nothing that Congress won't legislate on if it is in somebody's interest to do so. And the writer of the article, Rick Lynch, agrees with the Anti-Federalists on this. I don't. If it weren't for the Bill of Rights, we wouldn't have any freedoms left now. We would be in a total police state. And even though we are approaching that, there is still a great deal that we have left. The Bill of Rights restrained the federal government for a 100 years. The first time in history that for a century a government was restrained enough that the people enjoyed virtually unlimited freedom. No income tax, no searches and seizures without warrants, uh, no limitations on the press, no state religion, no many, many things that were commonplace in Europe and Asia. And it was thanks to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that this existed. The document was not perfect, but it was good enough to give a 100 years that laid the groundwork for the prosperity that we enjoy in this country. And even though the economy is ailing, we still enjoy such things as $500 or $1,000 computers. We enjoy such things as $80 VCRs. We enjoy all kinds of things that would have not been possible without the free market that the Constitution provided for. So we have a great deal to be thankful to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights for. Yes, they broke down because they were not perfect. And if we get a second chance, we have got to design ways to hold the people in government accountable for their acts. No longer can they say, well, maybe I shouldn't have voted for that bill. Now if they vote for a bill that destroys somebody's life, they should be personally responsible for it. And if that's going to keep a lot of people from running for Congress, so be it. What we will have are people running for Congress or the presidency who are willing to abide by the Constitution and not pass or sign laws that could possibly in any way disrupt somebody's life, turn somebody's life upside down, or even kill somebody. We would have presidents who would be scared to death to take the country into war for fear that the families of soldiers killed will investigate and sue on the basis that there was no threat to the United States of America. All sorts of things could take place that would be to our benefit if we could hold the people in government responsible for their acts. Today they are completely immune. Uh, the violation would have to be so gross 
and so obviously self-serving and so monetarily profitable to the individual before any kind of legal action would be taken against them. Now, we have a lot to be thankful for, but we have a lot to uh, bewail that we had lost or that America has lost from what it once was. And we hope we can rebuild a new America. We hope we can create America where people are free, where all the benefits of freedom will flow, the blessings of liberty in much better health care, much more inexpensive health care, much more user-friendly health care, where children are not in government schools and they're really learning what's important to them in much less time and at much, much less expense. All right. We're going to take our first break. Thank you for listening to me. When we come back, I would like to talk briefly about Christmas and the government and all of these uh, attempts to take Christmas nativity scenes off of public property and so on. And you're going to hear something a little different from me from what you've been hearing on television. We'll be right back. Well, Harry Brown here, and the phone number is 1-800-259-9231. That's 1-800-259-9231. And before we get on to Christmas, uh, I do want to mention one thing that I forgot to say in the first segment about the Bill of Rights. Yes, there are invasions of free press. There are invasions of free speech. We've seen them, and we've even discussed them on this show, and there have been other things of that sort. But all of these invasions are contested, and many of the invasions are overturned and stopped uh, through the courts and other ways. And we don't realize here how fortunate we are in the free speech we do have, and the free press we do have, and the freedom of religion. In uh, many, many countries of Europe, the government collects in taxes the working expenses of the churches and turn some money over to the churches and you have to declare yourself a non-believer in order to evade those taxes in england there is an official secrets act which gives the government the right to stop any newspaper from printing anything that anybody in the government believes might be harmful to the government so there is not nearly the free press in england that there is here with the internet we get a lot of information from english publications like the guardian and the independent and and so on that is about the war in Iraq and other things of that sort. But if they start getting too close to the British government in the things that they write, they can be stopped legally in England. Uh, it's a situation that we today would find intolerable. But, of course, we may be in that same situation 20 years from now, and people will just assume that that's necessary. After all, you can't be running around saying bad things about the government. You might be interfering with the war effort. Well, let's move on to Christmas. There has been, as there is, most every year in the last decade, a hullabaloo about whether or not nativity scenes can appear on government property, whether any kind of religious observance uh, can creep into the Christmas holidays or the holidays uh, at the courtrooms and in other places around the country. And I have to tell you that I am on the side of people who think that this is inappropriate. And I think my reasons are a little different from those of the ACLU, or perhaps my way of expressing my reasons is different from the ACLU and the other organizations which register these complaints. I believe that this is really much ado about nothing. Much like, gee, we've got to stop Hillary Clinton from getting elected president in 2008. Much like, gee, we've got to do something to defend marriage, because if gays get, marriage, then, get married, then I guess the institution of marriage will crumble, and I won't be married anymore to my spouse, whom I love very much. I mean, these are ridiculous arguments. They are ridiculous crises. They are ridiculous scandals. They are ridiculous debates about the nativity scenes on government property and things of this sort, what I don't understand is when you've got a country full of Jerry Falwells and James Dobsons, and you've got hundreds of thousands of churches, and you have millions and millions of acres of public property, uh, private, pardon me, millions and millions of acres of private property, why is it that we need to have government property being used for these things? Yes, it may seem like a small matter, but the fact of the matter is that it is money that's being paid for, uh, property that was paid for by taxpayers. It's, it's workers who are being paid by taxpayers who are in many cases being involved in setting these things up. Maybe the expenses seem petty compared to the cost of big government itself, but big government is largely made up of all kinds of petty expenses, of all kinds of ridiculous small expenses that add up to big government. And the fact of the matter is, that there is no plausible, intelligent, logical, rational reason that these things have to appear on government property. As I said, there are millions of acres, millions of square miles, I guess, of private property on which all of these displays can be made. I don't think any town in the country would be bereft of Christmas displays if they were limited to private property, in store windows, on uh, private fields, on private uh, vacant lots, uh, on people's homes. I mean, you drive through any neighborhood this week, and you're going to see all kinds of Christmas decorations outside, Christmas lights, other things. It's a ridiculous argument. It's a ridiculous debate over this, because there is no reason in the world that it's necessary. So why is the debate taking place? Not because Christmas is in danger of being blotted out of our lives, but because 
conservatives want an issue to rally the troops to. Just like they are talking about gay marriage, just like they're talking about Hillary Clinton, these terrible threats to our heritage, to our country, to our future. And one of the arguments that's given is that the country was founded on Christian principles, and they quote, find very uh, esoteric quotes from George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, who both of whom were probably deists and not Christians, but may at, at one time or another have said something about we need God in our lives in order to form a good society or whatever it may be. So what? Those things are not a part of the legal documents. They are not a part of the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. They are not a part of our government. And maybe they have had a chaplain in the Senate since the beginning of the, the country. And maybe they have had all of these other things that they can cite chaplains in the army and that they invoked God's grace and they did this and they did that. But the fact of the matter is that anything having to do with religion should be kept out of government proceedings and government property. It is a very dangerous thing to uh, start on this road because of the fact that almost every country in the world has some kind of a state religion, even though we may not be aware of it. And once you have a, a religion dominating things of that sort, it does lead not just to discrimination, but very often to oppression of the other religions. And if this is a free country, if this is a country of liberty, if this was a country founded on the sovereignty of the individual, then every individual should be free to make his own decision, to be a Christian, to be a Jew, to be a Muslim, to be an atheist, to be an agnostic, to whatever it is that he believes is best. Because the founding fathers realized in 1789 and before that, the terrible dangers that had been created by having a state religion in Massachusetts, another state religion in Rhode Island, another state religion in Connecticut, where people were oppressed and uh, uh, not just discriminated against, but really oppressed by the state religion. And they vowed that this was not going to happen in the United States of America. We'll be back right after this break. This is Harry Brown. Well, welcome back. Harry Brown here. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. And with regard to the Bill of Rights, we've gotten a few emails. Pierre says, it appears that only the Third Amendment has not been trampled upon. And that's the amendment that says that the government may not quarter troops in private homes without the permission of the families. And Pierre goes on to say, not that I mean to tip off the government. Thankfully, they don't read the Constitution, so I'm sure we'll be safe from troops quartering in our homes, to which I might add, for the time being. And Jason writes to say, all these government warnings about suspending the Constitution are to get us ready for the day they finally do it. We need to come up with an intelligent response argument that convinces people beyond a reasonable doubt that suspending the Constitution in the event of terrorism is just a ruse and not a legitimate response. What does taking away our freedoms have to do with responding to terrorism? Well, we've seen, Jason, how people can become so afraid, really, of a threat to the nation, such as terrorism was described after 9-11, that they think it is ridiculous to stand on ceremony and obey the Constitution and respect freedom of speech and uh, respect the rights of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments when you're dealing with terrorists. My God, the Bill of Rights shouldn't apply to terrorists. Well, they should. the Bill of Rights, of course, should apply to terrorists because you don't even know if someone is a terrorist until he has had his day in court, until he has confronted his accusers, until he has been tried by a jury of his peers, until he has had a right to counsel, until the other side of the story from that being peddled by the government is actually heard in court, in open court. And so, of course, the Bill of Rights should apply to terrorists, should apply to the worst kinds of murderers, should apply to anyone who has been accused of any crime. But my point is that that isn't what's discussed in the papers. That's not what's discussed on the chat shows on television. Rather, they're talking about uh, the danger that's involved, and they don't even hint at the danger that's involved in suspending the Bill of Rights. So you've raised an important question, Jason. We do need to be able to respond, and not in a long lecture, and not in a long instruction on the value of the Constitution, but we need to get to the point quickly in a few sentences. And it's something I should give some thought to. And anyone listening who's given some thought to this and come up with a response to this whole idea that we need to suspend the Constitution if necessary in order to be able to be safe from terrorists, if you've uh, come up with some response to that that's short and sweet, I sure would like to hear it. And I invite you to call in and share that with everyone. Kayleen in Massachusetts writes to say, My husband is the organizer of the Boston Libertarian Meetup. This past Wednesday, eight of us were there, and we had a quite lively discussion. One of the subjects was the Bill of Rights Day, and one of our group passed out a paper about it. We very much enjoy our meetups and always meet new people. What surprises me is how few of the folks we've met regularly listen to your show. My husband and I always talk of it and encourage the folks that meet up to listen to it. In the case that your listeners would be interested in going to or even organizing their own libertarian meetup, please let them know that it is simply an informal chit-chat session at a relaxed place for people who are libertarians or interested in libertarianism. They can go to 
libertarian.meetup.com and find the section for their own state to join or to start a local meetup. Well, that's very interesting. And I will put on the radio links page the website for Libertarian Meetup. It's just libertarian.meetup.com. And I'll put it up there anyway, even though you got it from me orally. But uh, I think this is a really good idea. If I understand the meetups, it is that there is no agenda. There is no Robert's Rules of Order. There is no quorum. There is nothing else. It's just libertarians getting together and discussing things. And in the process, they may broaden their knowledge and their understanding of libertarian principles. They may plot and plan something. They may just talk about how to, to better communicate libertarian ideas. They may talk to each other about problems they've run into in discussing libertarian ideas with other people. All sorts of things can come up at these meetups. It's like a small party. Perhaps they even do it uh, in some places in the back room of a Denny's. Who knows? And uh, we have a question here from Don out there in cyberspace. And he says that your book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, has had a huge influence in my life, and I've often wondered why you don't mention the book. Maybe you no longer think the way that you did in How I Found Freedom regarding political involvement and other things. And I know many who were influenced by the book and now wonder the same as I do, why whether you now think the same way. He goes on to say the world becomes more unfree every year, and it gets very depressing to contemplate where we're headed. Thus, the book or its message becomes more important every year. And he goes on to say, I was much happier when I took the book's advice, but does happiness deserve priority, or is happiness just short-term thinking compared to the future of the country? We know we are losing freedom, but are we gaining any freedom at the same time? Certainly people in some nations are becoming more free, for instance, Eastern Europe, India, China, and so forth. And there are things to feel good about. A year or two ago, I concluded that the Internet and the media are slowly emasculating our governments. Scandals come to light almost in real time. Oppositional views get more and better exposure. While the current war is very demoralizing, the public actually is more informed about the war than in the past. Just compare today to a half century ago, this has to be a vast improvement. So, are we not seeing all the good things to feel, all the things to feel good about? Or is it that there's nothing good to see? How do we find freedom in today's unfree world? I could sure use some positive motivation. Well, there are a lot of uh, questions, a lot of points in this email from Don. And first of all, with regard to the book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, the book first came out in 1973. An updated version was issued in 1998. Now, when I say updated, I really changed only a handful of words in the body of the book, but I added a foreword and an afterword. And we'll continue to discuss Don's questions when we come back from this break. This is Harry Brown, and you can join the fun, 1-800-259-9231, or email me, question at harrybrown.org. We'll be right back. All right, we were talking about my book, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World, and the updated version, and I hate to say, let's say the second edition that was published in 1998 after the book had fallen out of print and a very small publisher in Montana said he would like to bring it back into print, and he did so. Uh, all that it contained that was different from the first one was a foreword and an afterword, basically the afterword, which just brought my thinking up to date on a couple of key issues in the book, one of which was getting involved in politics. In 1973, I stated that I did not get involved in politics in any way, I didn't vote, and I didn't see any difference between the parties, and I didn't see any reason to get involved in government in any way whatsoever. And then, of course, in 1996, I ran for president, so it did require some explanation in 1998, and uh, partly the explanation was that you should do what you want to do. That was the point of the book in the first place, was that you should live your life according to your own lights and not what other people think is best. And I decided that what I wanted to do was to run for president, and I ran for president. And I just loved it so much, I did it twice. In any event, that book now is out of print because that little publisher in Montana uh, went out of business and, in fact, has disappeared. And it's really unfortunate. But the partial good news is that I'm discussing now with another publisher the possibility of bringing out a third edition. It really will be the second edition reprinted. So it may be available in the near future, and when it is, we'll have a commercial on this show, even if I forget to mention it. As to where we're going and the world getting less free, there's no question that it is much less free than when I wrote that book in 1973, less, much less free in America. And one of the chapters was provided some principles about how to get around taxes and how to get around government. And there's no question that it is more difficult to do that now than it was then. But perhaps the key principle involved here is that once you make up your mind that you are going to try to get around taxes and get around government without getting yourself into trouble, Avenues will begin to appear to you that you did not see before when you just simply assumed you had to go along with whatever they said. The first and giant step is to make up your mind that you're going to look for possibilities. And when you do that, 
very likely you will find some. You just need to be careful that when people say, hey, it's not, there's no legal necessity that you pay taxes, that Congress has never passed a law saying you have to pay taxes and so on, be very, very careful. People who say things like that very often go to jail. And going to jail is not where you're going to find freedom in an unfree world. Uh, the question came up, does happiness preserve, deserve priority or is happiness just short-term thinking? Happiness is what we live for. Happiness is the feeling of well-being. And different people take different routes to get to that feeling of well-being. Uh, some of them get jobs, raise families, and have a good time that way and, and get a feeling of well-being. Others do it by robbing banks. Others do it by doing good works for others, and that's where they find their happiness, their feeling of well-being. Others do it by becoming Trappist monks and never speaking another word. Uh, happiness varies from individual to individual because we are all different from each other, and we have different inputs that create happiness. And as a result, what is uh, what provides happiness for one person does not necessarily provide happiness for somebody else. And so you have to be very careful when somebody says, this is the road to happiness. It's a road that you have to discover yourself. But if saving the country is what's going to bring you more happiness, then that's what you want to do. If you can find ways to enjoy yourself without saving the country, then that's what you should do. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Hello again, Harry Brown here, and just to finish up this email from Don, he mentioned the Internet and the media slowly emasculating our government. So I think that's a very good point. We have discussed it on the show before, that the Internet has made it possible for people to, to get information while it is still relevant. As I've uh, used the example before, the real truth about Pearl Harbor didn't come out until years after the end of World War II, and by then people didn't care anymore. If the war was over, why are you raking up all this stuff? The information about Iraq is coming out while the war on Iraq is going on, and as a result, it is not something that people take with a grain of salt and say that's not relevant anymore. And so I think that the Internet is a very, very powerful force uh, against government, and that example that I gave you is just one of many possible examples that could be given, and I will not try to think of any more right now because we've got people waiting on the phone. Andrea in New York is with us. Good evening, how Andrea. How are you tonight? I'm just fine. We have a couple of minutes before the break, so if you uh, want to state something or yeah. ask a question, then we'll get to it after the well, uh, news. Good. Actually, we began a conversation last week, and we started some observations related to where, and I, I appreciate that you started in, uh, you know, the Lord really honored us where, um, you know, we decided in honoring him, and, you know, many of the founding fathers believe in the Lord, although, you know, some were deists, but regardless, they still attempted in their lives to identify with who they, you know, some being that they thought was the highest being. But back to um, it having been Bill of Rights Day, I actually want to address really the body of the Constitution, and I, you referenced earlier Article 1, Section 8, which actually I had mentioned also last week. But I noticed that, and I noticed that, you know, well, we can discuss this, but that the libertarians very much support free trade, you know. There's a huge difference between free trade and open trade, but at a minimum, the notion that um, even though Article 1, Section 8 really make no argument for free trade. I mean, part of the indirect taxation that it did call for were with respect to duties, tariffs, and excise taxes. And, the, and, and I believe that there was that um, that was in the framework in part to not only encourage for us to do commerce, among, commerce and, and, and develop and establish among ourselves. Meanwhile, coincident with all of that, the British, the British crown, which if you recall were the commercial interests, they, it was the sovereign, it was the king who was beholden the commercial interest in his society. And their, their method of, of um, trade and commerce was free trade. And, and uh, the, whole, the whole concept of free trade includes literally controlling the transportation of the goods. All right, we'll, we'll discuss that when we come back after the news, plus other things. Uh, James is waiting on the phone, and I've got some interesting emails that have come in, so you don't want to miss the second hour of this show. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. And uh, all right, now we're talking with Andrea in New York about free trade. But, you know, Andrea, first you mentioned about the Founding Fathers and uh, their Lord. And I, I want to say that I am not going to dispute that all the evidence that's being presented by people uh, that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and so on were really at heart Christians, and they felt that uh, an understanding of God and Jesus Christ and all of this was necessary in order for America to work, and so on. In fact, PL in Tennessee sent me 27 pages huh. downloaded from wow. a website that uh, some uh, it's a religious website, and with a quote from George Washington that says, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. And I don't know whether the quote is accurate, but it really doesn't matter. True. Because this was George Washington's opinion. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and apparently many other of the founding fathers were Freemasons. Now, that doesn't mean that they believed we had to have Freemasonry in order to uh, have a constitution and to have a country, or that Freemasonry should be made the national 
uh, what would it be, the official organization of the United States government or whatever, you know. Uh, the point is that there is a difference between private opinions and governmental law. There is a difference between what we want and what we try to force on other people through the force of law that is backed up by guns. And there is nothing that I have ever seen that anybody presented that whereby George Washington and Thomas Jefferson or any other founding father said that we must use the government to enforce the teachings of Jesus Christ and so on. I, we agree, absolutely. Right. Well, I'm, I'm one of the few people who probably, I, I actually vigorously opposed faith-based initiative and heard, had heard DeLuno speak at the Harbor Club and had faced virtual brutalization uh, up here in my neighborhood in Harlem when, uh, I, I don't know that it was Charlie Rangel, but I think they, the Bush administration early on attempted to coordinate with um, some of the local black pastors but see, a lot of it is just, it's just work. You know, it's just a way to secure votes. It's a way to do the public-private partnership. Um, now, it's, it's, it's a way to get government to control those things by providing money true. and then putting the strings on the money true. after the people true. become dependent upon true. it. True, absolutely. And this is not, I mean, the rugged individualism that Americans had originally been noted for, um, you know, and that I think that the royalty in Europe or that the elite in Europe had actually, I think, despised. Um, that rugged individualism really is eroded where you have uh, government involvement and or government subsidies and things like that. But you know, I, I, I know we, want to, we do want to talk about free trade. I yes, but before we get to, before we get to free trade, uh, uh, we can perhaps end this discussion about Christianity and government because I do want to read a paragraph from Pierre that came in, and then we can call that subject quits. He said, regarding the holidays, as a deeply pious person, the last institution I would ever want to molest my faith is government. Uh, the entire notion of incorporating any element of a religion with a state reeks of big government. This is the great logical fallacy of so-called limited government conservatives. Bingo, Pierre. Uh, I've said so often, as somebody who is opposed to abortion, the last thing in the world I would want is a government war on abortion because it would fail as miserably as the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on illiteracy, and virtually every other war that our government has, has entered into, which never delivered on any of the promises that were made when the war was started. And so anybody who is a Christian or a Jew, or a Muslim, should be very wary of any idea that government can help promote your religion, because you are just headed for trouble whenever you rely on the government for anything. You are never going to get what you want from government, unless you are somebody with tremendous political influence, and I doubt that anybody listening to the show is. Are you listening, Rudolph Giuliani? <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, enough of that subject. Now we're talking about free trade, and you said just before the break that free trade means control, and I don't know what you meant by that. Well, there's a difference between, it's not that free trade means control, but that apparently the, the fact, it, it is to, to a certain degree a misnomer, um, and a misnomer is actually quite a very old misnomer because the British Crown had practiced, um, or had very, or in, in as much as possible, attempted to um, fully practice free trade. Now, there, apparently, what free trade, in the concept in which um, we are, are Ignorant is that it not only means that the goods are imported without tariff, it also or duty or excise tax or anything. It also means that the parties, meaning the British Crown, completely controlled the the uh, transportation of the goods in and out. And their premise was based supposedly on Adam Smith's observation that in some particular cases, some societies might have certain advantages to trade in certain regions or for certain goods and services or something like that. You know, if, I think the contemporary expression is comparative advantage, but I still think that that's just contemporary colonialism. I think, I think again, um, our, our founding fathers, however, um, apparently we, I wouldn't say we did piracy. I suppose you, you may want to make that argument a little bit because the British attempted to literally control, if they could get away with it, the importation of goods into the colonial mm -hmm. region. I think it was only after the French and Indian War, though, that, that things get really sticky because the, um, the British commercial interest did not want to pay the king the tax that um, apparently was burdening um, England with, uh, with relation to the French and Indian War. So they told the king, you get it from the colonies. And, and so to, to some respect, that, that's partly how it was the taxes were increasing here. Well, the Boston Tea Party was a revolt against controlled trade. It was a revolt against the British uh, uh, imposition of a regulation that said that the colonists had to have tea from the East India, British East India Company. Sure. And that's why they threw the tea in the harbor, is to, was to protest this fact that they couldn't just buy their tea from whomever they wanted. Correct. That was one of the reasons. There, but that's what free trade was. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not free trade if you can't buy from whomever you want. Well, that's open trade. That's a different thing. Uh, we'll finish this up when we come back in just a couple of minutes, and then we'll go on to some other calls. This is Harry Brown. Don't go away. Well, hello again. Harry Brown here, and we're talking with Andrea in New York about free trade. Now, there are all sorts of expressions, open trade, fair trade, managed trade, free trade, and so on, but really there are only two alternatives. Either people are free to buy what they want, uh, from anyone that they want to buy from anywhere in the world, or the government will decide what we're allowed to buy. Now, 
Free trade means an absence of control because there is no decision by the government that you can't buy Italian wine or you can't buy Italian shoes or you can't buy Chinese toys for your children or whatever it may be or companies cannot get steel unless they pay absorbent taxes and so forth. The fact that tariffs were allowed for in the Constitution does not mean that the founders did not believe in free trade. There is a difference between being taxed and being prohibited from buying something or being taxed prohibitively. What was being done at the time of the Constitution and the first uh, 50, 60 years of the government was that they were just very, very minor taxes that were imposed upon imports, and they were imposed indiscriminately, meaning that some uh, imports didn't pay three or four or five times as much as other imports paid. That was what is called a revenue tariff, meaning that the tariff is there just to provide revenue for the government. Um, but a discriminatory tariff is one where a 50% tariff is put on one thing and there's a 1% tariff on something else or a 0% tariff on something else. And the 50% tariff is there to, to provide uh, protection for a particular industry in this country. And it's really called a protective tariff as opposed to a, a revenue tariff. And there was none of that until the Whigs and the Republicans started imposing those kinds of protective tariffs in the mid-50s, which led, incidentally, to the Civil War. When Lincoln was inaugurated in 1861, he said he would do nothing to interfere with slavery in the southern states, but that he would send troops into the southern states if necessary to collect taxes. And the southerners objected to the idea that the northerners who controlled Congress were imposing these horrendous tariffs on goods that they wanted to buy from Europe to protect the northern industries. And then the money collected from the tariffs was used for corporate welfare, to build bridges and to do other things in the northern states. And this is what the South objected to the most. And Lincoln made it clear that that was going to continue. And and slavery can continue too, but just as long as the North was able to collect all those taxes. Now, my point is that free trade means an absence of control, and that any kind of imposition that is put in by government is the first step to having government decide what we can buy and what we can't buy. So fair trade is really government-managed trade, and managed trade is government-managed trade. And all these different expressions that are used are just ways of saying we want the government to stop uh, certain goods from coming into this country because they hurt our jobs, they hurt our profits, they hurt our industries, or whatever it is. And in a free country, you can't have anything but free trade. Uh, last, make a last point, Andre, and then we've got to move on. Well, thank you. You make a very good point about where um, uh, I suppose um, in an assumption that there can be uh, a degree of just how onerous the tariff can be. But still, if price, if price added on, meaning the tariff added on to the price of the imported good, is the only criteria that acts as the difference between what you can buy domestically and what you can buy, um, you know, I import. I, I still see it as still um, that is open trade because literally the only difference is there's, it's not a prohibition of it being imported. We're not rejecting it from being imported. We're just in effect, um, you know, using the form of indirect taxation, which, meanwhile, remember, we all prosper. If we're encouraged to do business with each other, you're raising all the boats higher. And in a society where everybody's supposed to be equal under the law, and I may have mangled the part of the Constitution that says that, but the, but the reality is, is that if you're going to deem everyone equal under the law, then at a minimum you can respect each other with regard to how you allocate your commerce, so to speak. Well, actually, there's nothing in the Constitution promoting uh, equality under the law, but the more important point is that what you're talking about is autarky, which is where a certain group of people get together and say that they will not trade with anybody outside their group, and this limits the standard of living tremendously because the more people that are in the group, the greater the division of labor, the more products that are available, and the, the better the things that we have to choose from. So you wouldn't want to say that you only want to deal with members of your own family. You wouldn't be able to have an automobile. You probably couldn't have a house. You probably couldn't have hardly anything that you now enjoy. The same would be true to a lesser extent, but still to a strong extent, if you only treated, traded with people within your state. And the same thing is true, again, to a lesser extent, but still to a significant extent, if you only traded with people in America. We trade with people throughout the world because there are people in other parts of the world that can provide things, sometimes at a lower cost, sometimes with better uh, artisanship, uh, sometimes uh, just simply more choices. Uh, because they are, uh, there are so many more people uh, willing to trade with us. Right. But I, I didn't say, and not to cut you off, but I didn't say that there would be a prohibition. I only said that, that there would be a tariff against it. And right. that, that doesn't stop anybody who has the means or the interest to buy it and pay more than they would have paid a fellow American. To right. But the tariffs tariff. will be imposed in accordance with the wishes of those who have the most political influence, well, not, not on the basis of what is best for the United I, States I, of America. That's a good point, although it was written into our rule of law. And so since that was our rule of law, and, and, and Franklin said, you know, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. Um, yes. it, there was so, it was really very simple, and, and since, since the nature of how, how that indirect taxation would provide revenues for the federal government, and not as if they all agreed on, on um, even at that minimum amount of federalism. Well, but, but it was a revenue tariff and not a, pr a protective tariff. True. And today, 
what we need to run this government could be done with a 1% tariff on all imported goods, no income tax, nor corporate tax, no uh, state tax, no gift tax. Now, we wouldn't have federal involvement in health care, education, welfare, and all these other things. Uh, but a 1% tax could, uh, a 1% tax on imports, which would not be, which would not interfere uh, with anybody getting what they wanted anywhere, that would provide for all the constitutional functions of government. In fact, it would provide a stronger national defense than we have now, but it wouldn't provide the national offense that we have now. Andrea, thank you very You're much welcome. for your calls. You're, You're, You're uh, well read, and I appreciate your, your viewpoints. Let's um, go now. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Let's just wait until we come back, James and Oregon, and we'll take you next. And when we come back, we'll see what's on your mind. And we do have some uh, more interesting emails that have come in that I would like to get to. And we will try to do that before we say goodbye. So, why don't you come back to us uh, when we come back from this break? This is Harry Brown's Just Don't Go Away. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown. Let us now go to the far side of the country from New York to Oregon and talk with James. Good evening, James. Good evening, Harry. First of all, my apologies for keeping you waiting so long. Not a problem. Uh, I enjoyed Andrea Little Park. Okay, good. What's up tonight? Uh, well, uh, actually, I was listening to Andrea, <laughs> and um, I believe Jefferson and Franklin were both deists. Uh, you know anything about that? Well, that's always been the common assumption that Washington and uh, Jefferson and probably Franklin, too, were uh, deists. But in well, the least... people who reject the Messiah myth, right? Yes, uh, that uh, a deist, strictly speaking, is somebody who believes in God, but not in any particular organized religion. Uh, but in recent years, a number of religious leaders have been uh, trying very hard to uh, convince people that uh, they, the founding fathers that are normally thought of as theists were really Christians. And I am not going to take a side on that because for two reasons. Number one, I don't have the time to investigate it. <clears throat> and number two, as I said earlier, it really doesn't matter. Right, not a biggie, not a biggie. Right, if we suddenly found out that in secret they were all Muslims mm -hmm. and that we got perfect, uh, conclusive evidence that this was the case, what difference would it make? Right. We would still have the Constitution we have. We would still have the problems that we have today. And those problems would not be solved by a return to the Muslim religion or the Christian religion or the Jewish religion uh, in some kind of government-influenced way. Yes, the uh, Founding Fathers had their own beliefs and their own opinions, and what is important is not those opinions and those beliefs and their religion, but rather what they put into the Constitution. It's a non sequitur. Yes, very good. Um, actually, not what I wanted to call about it. I suspected that was the case. <laughs> uh, it was more um, some author somewhere a long time ago, very smart man apparently, um, decided to explain why humans have rights. And he did it in a religious context. In other words, his one of the conclusions that he made was that uh, you, can't believe, you can't believe that you have human rights if you don't believe in God. He connected those two concepts anyway. Um, that is not the case. And I think every reasonable pe person knows that uh, the reason people have rights is very axiomatic to our existence. So uh, what I'm saying is that there is a logical basis for our uh, uh, Bill of Rights, human rights, whatever, um, that have nothing to do with religion. And we have to build that, build on that, so that we can truly separate religion from state. Are you following me so far? Yes. Um... Uh, and I think as a start, one of the best explanations I've heard for why human beings have rights is that as soon as you're born, you enter into a contract with the state government or the, you know, the state and uh, you're born with infinite freedom. What you're doing is you're trading your freedoms, or certain freedoms, for certain rights. You're trading the freedom to kill people, which you are actually born with, for the freedom, for the right not to be killed. But how can a newborn enter into a contract with well, anyone? Well, it's one of the things that, oh, as soon as you break the contract, as soon as you kill someone, you lose the right to life. Yes, but the, but the newborn has not agreed to this contract. But he hasn't disagreed. Uh, the thing is, it's, it's sort of a, um, an axiomatic uh, justification for... Uh, the state taking on certain responsibilities of everyone's life, and number one is justice. People don't want to deal with justice on an individual level. They don't. No, but, they, but, that, but that's a decision that they can make at some point in their life that they don't want to, and some people may choose to say, no, I'd rather do it myself. Okay. Uh, let's say you reach the age of consent and you say, I don't want. Uh, I want justice handled on an, on an individual level. I will take care of my own justice. Okay, you'd have to move to a place that has no state at all. Right? That right. Would be, so, so, so it isn't really voluntary to enter into the contract. Well, what's wrong with coordinating off the country into... State well, and non-state part. Well, that's a decision you're making uh, in saying that it would be that it's a good thing. I, I don't happen to believe in rights in this context because the rights are really meaningless. If the government 
takes away uh, your right to privacy, if the government takes away your right to publish a newspaper or whatever it is and enforces that by with guns, your rights have meant nothing. Uh, rights are meaningful in the context of voluntary consent. Two people get together and say, all right, let's go into business together. Let's draw up a contract. Here's the contract that says that you have these obligations and you also have these privileges, and I recognize your rights, you recognize your obligations, I recognize my obligations, you recognize my rights. We both agree to this, we both sign this, and if one believes that the other has violated the contract, they mediate it in some way to try to settle it according to the decision that was made in that contract that they made. And in this context, rights and duties and privileges make complete sense. But they don't make sense where guns are involved, where the person with the rights is the person with the power. And the person who doesn't have any power doesn't have any rights whatsoever. And what we get in life is not because we have a right to it, but, but simply because we are able to get it. Because nobody has interfered with it, nobody has taken it away from us by force, nobody has done this or that. And some people are more successful than, than others at being able to do that, to get through life without running into the state or private criminals or other people who impede their progress. But in the final analysis, your rights are really meaningless if somebody has the power to take them away from you and wants to do so. The Bill of Rights is an important document because it spells out what government is not allowed to do. But as we have seen, government is taking away those rights, and it is declaring in the process that it is respecting those rights. And this kind of hypocrisy is very, very prevalent with government. And uh, it's, it's very unfortunate, but we have to find a way to try to stop them. And the, the only thing that I know of that can stop them is building a wave of public opinion that they will be afraid of. They will be afraid of... of uh, of uh, violating or afraid of, of ignoring. And uh, I think that that's possible, but it's going to be a very, very difficult task. I don't know. Am I making any sense to you, James? Sure. It always makes sense to me, right? <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, you were talking about music tonight. Hmm. Uh, yes. You're a classical guy, obviously. I would recommend Firth of Fifth. I'm um, sorry? Janice. Say it again. Firth of Fifth. It's Firth, F-I-R-T-H? -F that's correct. Firth of Fifth. It's a play on words. It's actually a play on words. A uh, place in England is called Fourth of Fifth. Oh, I see. And, and by Genesis, is that a, uh, a, a... Genesis is a rock group. Oh, I see. It's, it's a very classical piano piece. Huh. I think you'll like it. All right, I appreciate it. I've written it down. James, as always, I'm glad to hear from you. Uh, you're a very smart fellow, James. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, folks, so don't go away. Well, thank you for staying tuned. We have two segments to go, and so I'm glad you're still with me. Uh, a number of interesting emails came in. One from Paul says, Conservatives always seem to need an enemy. And I believe that was my point also, that this whole idea about Christmas on public property and prayer in the schools is right in the same camp with opposing gay marriage and opposing Hillary Clinton and so forth. They need an enemy. They need somebody uh, to get mad at. And it comes basically, I think, from the conservative organizations who are trying to raise money. And the best way to raise money in the view of most organizational fundraisers is to predict disaster if something isn't done to head it off quickly. So, boy, you better send us money or Hillary Clinton will get elected. You better send us money or uh, Christian principles will be wiped out of public life and so on. So Paul says, conservatives always seem to need an enemy. Here are two Christian principles for them. One, one must choose Christ. Imposing Christ does not do anyone any good. Number two, pray in secret so that your Father who sees you will reward you in secret. Hypocrites and Pharisees pray in public. So I guess Christians shouldn't pray in public schools. Very good. And regarding free trade, um, one of the arguments that's always presented for free trade is that, well, free trade's all well and good in principle, but if the other guy doesn't have free trade, if the other guy doesn't let his goods, or doesn't let your goods into his country, then we should stop them from letting, their, uh, we should stop them from being able to send their goods into our country. And I got a quote from someone who didn't sign. Oh, yes, uh, Bill in San Diego uh, gave us a quote from Joan Robinson, an economist, who said, if your trading partner throws rocks into his harbor, that is no reason to throw rocks into your own harbor. In other words, if somebody is so stupid, as uh, some government is so stupid and tyrannical as to not let your products into their company, thereby uh, lowering the standard of living of people in that other country, we shouldn't be so stupid to retaliate by lowering the standard of living in our country, which is what we do when we uh, stop uh, goods from coming into this country. Justin says, I wonder if you could explain the reasons why the government changed the Constitution to allow for the direct election of senators rather than having them appointed by the state legislatures. What was the reasoning of the Founding Fathers in keeping them from being elected, and who benefited from the change in the Constitution to allow for direct elections? In the original Constitution, the members of the House of Representatives were to be elected by the ordinary citizens voting within their states. 
but the senators were to be appointed by the state legislatures. They would appoint two senators from each state and send them to Washington. When Lincoln ran against Douglas and had the Lincoln-Douglas debates, they were not running for president, even though they ran against each other for president later. They were running for the U.S. Senate, and even though they were debating in public and appealing to the voters, they were just hoping that the voters would put pressure on the state legislature to appoint one or the other. As it turned out, they appointed Douglas, and Lincoln never went to the Senate. The reasoning behind this was that if one house was in effect controlled by the state legislatures, they uh, would veto any proposal that would give the federal government more power at the expense of the states. It was a way of dividing the powers and creating the balance of powers between the states, the government, and the people themselves. The states, the federal government, and the people themselves. And this was a very, very important part of the division of powers that helped to keep the federal government in check. But then came the Progressive Era, the late 1800s and the early 1900s, at a time when there was this great movement for democracy, for more democracy, for more things to be voted on by the people, for more government agencies to regulate commerce, to build a better society through government, which means using the guns of government, but they never mentioned that. And a number of things happened uh, at much the same time. The FTC and the uh, ICC, which is the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate railroads, was put in in the late 1800s, and then in the first 15 years of the uh, 1900s, we had the income tax, we had the Federal Reserve System created, and we had a new amendment to the Constitution which changed the method of selecting the senators so that they would now be voted on directly by the people. This wiped out one of the important uh, elements of the balance of power in Washington. So now there was nobody representing the states or even the people. You could say the people, the senators and the congressmen were elected by the people, but what you had was unchecked democracy, which could run roughshod over those who didn't vote for the winners and there was nothing to stop them now and it is a very very important change that was taking place and one that needs to be over uh, needs to be repealed at some point in order to restore the kind of government that the founding fathers had in mind we'll be back in just a couple of minutes don't go away this is harry brown well this is the final segment so let me thank you very very much for tuning in tonight and i want to thank scott hartman for taking everything taking care of everything in minnesota and keeping us on the air and before we go let's take one last email and this uh, is from Johnny in Wichita, who says that he introduced uh, libertarian ideas to a fellow from Brazil a couple of years ago. And he mentions in the course of this that I introduced him to Richard Mayberry's early warning report, to which he is now addicted, and gave him some footage from your campaigns and copy of why government doesn't work. And I want to mention that Richard Mayberry will be back on the show two weeks from tonight. I'm looking forward to that. He really does an excellent job of checking out what's going on around the world. And he's a very interesting fellow, so I think you'll enjoy that show. And in any event, because I don't have time to go into all of this, he, I will mention, though, that the fellow from Brazil, Brazil said that I would have been elected president if I'd been in the debates in 96 or 2000. And Johnny says he thinks so, too. But he says maybe this is a good time of year to introduce the Brazilian to the American expression, if ifs, ands, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Finally, he says, can you please give us an update on the war racket? As much of a scam as Social Security is, at age 27, I think I have more faith that I'll receive Social Security benefits than I do that I'll see the war racket published in my lifetime. Ah, uh, Johnny, I'm sorry about that. I get emails every single week. I get a few emails asking what the progress is on the war racket. And I, ever, I regret that I ever went public with the idea that I was writing such a book. It is really tough to get the time to work on it, and this is such an unusually large project that it is sprawling. I have been working on it for at least two years. I don't really remember exactly when I started, but I am determined that this book is going to be finished at some point, and I just don't know when, but I would say that it's not likely to be published any sooner than a year and a half from now because it probably will be a year before I finish it. And because it is turning into such a huge, huge amount of text, I have to figure out how I'm going to handle this. Am I going to break it up into several books or what? Because if I publish a 1,200-page book, it's only going to sell three copies because that's all the relatives I have. Thank you very, very much for being here. I want to remind you to do something nice for yourself and your family this week, and I hope the holidays have been a period of joy for you and not a period of pressure. I look forward to talking with you again, and I look forward to having a Merry Christmas myself, and I hope you do too. Good night.